be on the journey for anything rather than talk to the balding boar opposite. What more natural than to choose short stories? You'll never get through a novel and you know it. Yet how many actually do choose short stories? Well, I know I never used to, and until quite recently, publishers seem rather unwilling to print them. In Britain, they've never been as popular as abroad, but we do have something of a tradition, and now we're entering a rich period of British short story writing, according to Malcolm Bradbury. Malcolm Bradbury's written several short stories himself, but he's best known for his novels, including The History Man and Rates of Exchange. And he's also the editor of a new collection called The Penguin Book of Modern British Short Stories. I asked him, on the line to Norwich, where he teaches creative writing at the University of East Anglia, to attempt the impossible, to explain exactly what a short story is and how it has evolved. The short story is um, simply a version of the tale, which is normally a, a, a form that's narrated in public, you know, by a storyteller. And uh, it's, it's gradually, it all gets written down. I always think the classic uh, one is the Arabian Nights, which is presented uh, as if it were a told tale. Yes, the, f the first kind of East Enders. In a yes, sense. exactly, that's right. But um, one of the fascinating moments in the evolution of the short story is the way in which it moves from being just any tale that is told to some sort of um, analytical form and um, various refinements creep in. The classic refinement being, I suppose, in the early 19th century, Edgar Allan Poe's attempt to define the short story as um, being like a, a good long poem, a narrative that can be read at one sitting, that is all, all of a piece, that deals essentially with one single incident and has um, a very, very literary and symbolic shape to it. Do you think that's why people don't enjoy them quite so much, because there's, it's not exciting? Well, I, I, I think, it, to some degree, the modern short story is an acquired taste. The French have acquired it, the Americans have acquired it. If you pick up an American magazine like The New Yorker, it's filled not just with short stories, but with short stories of a very finished and sophisticated kind. We have, uh, have not had magazines of that kind very often. There have been one or two very interesting periods. There was an enormous revival of the short story during the, the last war partly because uh, it was um, easier to use the paper ration to print magazines rather than books. It tends to be associated with the success of a certain kind of, uh, of magazine publishing. And if you do have a magazine like The New Yorker, this stimulates a great deal of, uh, of literary activity. Yes. And the Americans have a great 20th century short story tradition. Have we? No, I don't think we, d we do in the same way. We can claim some very great short story writers from um, Victor Pritchett, V.S. Pritchett, through to Angus Wilson, to, to more recently people like um, Ian McEwan and Clive Sinclair. I think um, a very good sign of the fact that the short story is doing well is when you suddenly get a bunch of new writers who choose the short story as their first and primary form. And the two classic instances since the war that I'm particularly aware of are Angus Wilson, who in the late 40s emerged as a writer through two volumes of short stories, and then went on to become a novelist. And then Ian McEwan, who did exactly the same. I suppose my own interest in the short story was inspired by my love of poetry and by the compactness and delicacy which both forms share. V.S. Pritchett obviously felt the same way when he spoke to Bookshelf in 1980. It's the poetic side. A story is a kind of poem. It, it's a kind of sonnet. Even a story with a plot is like a ballad. Whereas the novel always seems to me a clumsy collection of uh, diffuse elements which can only be understood after ploughing your way through it you gradually see the whole scheme and the whole idea but the effect is slow to dawn on you whereas in the story it's sharp it absolutely within 10 pages you know exactly what the author wants to say and it doesn't bore people because it doesn't look at the obvious side of events necessarily but looks through them it's a kind of glimpse through what is happening Bernard McLaverty is a novelist and short story writer who has also turned his books into films. My Dear Palestrina, from a short story of the same name, was seen on television, and his novels, Lamb and Cal, have both been film successes as well as superb books. Northern Irish by birth, he moved to Scotland when he established himself as a writer and lived for eight years on a remote island. To read his latest collection, The Great Profundo, is to watch miracles taking place before your eyes. If anyone can define the short story, it is he. Oh, God. Uh, that's a v yeah, you did, you did start with a difficult <laughs> one. Uh, I mean, I think it's almost indefinable, because uh, if, if you say uh, something like, it must be short, 
then you, you find yourself saying that one of the best short stories is The Death of Ivan the Lich. Or if you say it must have characters in it, then you, you end up pointing to a story by, say, Liam O'Flaherty called The Wave, which is about the breaking of a wave on the shore. And can you define a novel and the difference between them? Because it is a difference in scope for a start, isn't it? Mm. For my own fiction, I wouldn't be concerned about that difference. Uh, Flannery O'Connor talks about that, the difference between novel and short story, and she says she doesn't care that it's a fiction that comes out at that length. And I would go along with that. Although there, there, there are some uh, obvious big differences that uh, the traditional sort of 19th century novel is about, you know, about society and interactions of people within that society. Whereas the short story tends to be about individuals outside the society. Um, Frank O'Connor talks about, you know, the, the short story is the best place for loneliness or for treating loneliness. And that's something to do with the nature of the short story, that it is outside society. And it's mm -hmm. about an individual outside society. O'Fillan compares the novel to a, a jumbo jet uh, in that it takes a long time to get off the ground. It can carry a huge number of passengers and it can go for great distances. But the short story is like a hot air balloon in that it takes off immediately, can only carry one or two people but it can go to vast heights. Most of the stories in Bernard McClavity's collection deal in some way with a sense of isolation, but within that the range is still amazing. Judge the quality of the writing for yourself in a moment when you can hear a whole story, but first, the process. In the beginning, you would, I would write a story and, and end up sort of crossing out words all over the page and restructuring and putting in arrows and things like that. But I think that now, part of the learning process is that you don't actually write down the really bad sentences that you say, no, that wouldn't work. And you, you put down very, very slowly uh, the sentences that are going to finally stand. There's a lot of very visual imagery which I connect with that you've looked at and seen, and which is lovely. But there's one, for instance, I can't even remember which story it's in, but someone goes shopping. And you've noticed the way that you drop mm. one tin into a string bag and it elongates. Oh, yes, it. yes, yeah. There's yeah. little things like that which are so delightful, little yeah. tiny brush strokes. Yeah, w one item elongating her string bag. There's a man I know who, who died recently who had a great way with verbs. Uh, he lived in Isla. He was very, very fond of a drink and uh, said to me one day, as I was windowsilling my way home last night, <laughs> which is a beautiful <laughs> verb. <laughs> it's almost to Lynn Thomas, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> There's another one to where you've just summed up Land Rovers, where you said that mushroom-coloured foam bulged from its crack, the seat of the Land Rover, and suddenly yeah. you're in the Land Rover and you can smell it, uh -huh. you can see it, and you can feel the dirt under your feet and everything. And, and the gear stick always wobbles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 These are just images uh, coming from having lived in a rural community for about eight years. That um, Yeah, the images themselves are, but the way you've picked them out mm -hmm. and used them, mm -hmm to kind of set fire to a whole page, mm -hmm. and, and it's absolutely beautiful. Mm, thank but you. <laughs> there's a lot of humour in the book as well, although it is about loneliness and people who are, in some sense, having problems with relationships and with mm. other people. And I love the one about the boy with the rash on his chest, mm -hmm. where his excuse for not going swimming is, I'm having my period. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, moments, <laughs> moments of embarrassment have always fascinated me, and I think that's one of the most embarrassing lines I have in any of, any of the stories. Yeah. <laughs> If it doesn't sound rude, how do you know when you've finished a story? Because, <clears throat> in a sense, you don't go for the twist on the mm -hmm. whole. It's mm -hmm. not a sudden, you know, it's not like a ghost story mm -hmm. or a detective story where there's a, ah, I suddenly see, how mm -hmm. clever. Mm -hmm. It's just a lovely, as I, I called it earlier, a watercolour, mm -hmm. maybe not mm -hmm. the right expression, but it's a it's a completeness. Mm -hmm. so two, two things to, to say about that is that H.E. Uh, Bates talks about the, that idea of the twist at the end. He says it annoys him intensely because it's like the first time you read a story, it's like somebody jumping out and saying boo to you. And then you read it again, and he does the same thing. And then when you read it for the 15th time, you know, he said, oh, God, no, not again. He's going to jump out and say boo to me. Uh, and I agree with him on that. On the second point, you just feel, you just know when, when, when there is enough there. And again, Chekhov says that uh, when you feel that you've finished a story, go and strike out the first paragraph and the last paragraph, and then you've got a real story. <laughs> oh, that's hard, isn't it? Yes. Have you but ever done right. that? He's right. Um, no, I've never had the courage to do that. I, I don't think I could bear to lose the last paragraph of that story, um, remote, about the woman on the island, which ends with that 
stunning image of the geese yes. going over like a, a dance hall full of people talking. Yeah, if you've ever heard them, uh, it's a, it's an accurate image. Mm, I mean, it certainly is. Th- there's nights I've tried to go to sleep on Isla and you, uh, Loch and Dahl fills up with thousands upon thousands of these geese, and it does. It sounds like somebody has told a wildly funny joke out in the middle of the water, and they're all going. <laughs> uh, I, I can't imitate it. Around about the end of each month, she would write a letter. But because it was December, she used an old Christmas card, which she found at the bottom of the biscuit tin among her pension books. She stood, dressed in her outdoor clothes, on tiptoe at the bedroom window, waiting for the bird watcher's Land Rover to come over the top of the hill two miles away. When she saw it, she dashed, slamming the door after her and running in her stiff-legged fashion down the lane onto the road. Her aim was to be walking, breathing normally, when the Land Rover would indicate and stop in the middle of the one-track road. Can I give you a lift? Aye. She walked round the front of the shuddering engine and climbed up to sit on the split seat. Mushroom-coloured foam bulged from its crack. More often than not, she had to kick things aside to make room for her feet. It was not the lift she would have chosen, but it was all there was. He shoved the wobbling stick through the gears, and she had to shout, each month, the same thing. Where are you for? The far side. I'm always lucky just to catch you. He was dressed like one of those hitchhikers. Green khaki jacket, cord trousers and laced-up mountain boots. His hair was long and unwashed and his beard divided into points like the teats of a goat. Are you going as far as the town this time? Yes. Uh, Will you drop me off? Sure. Christmas shopping? Aye, that'll be right. The road spun past, humping and squirming over peat bogs, the single track bulging at the passing places. Occasionally in the bog there were incisions, a black-brown colour, herring-boned with scars where peat had been cut. How's the birds doing? she shouted. Fine. I've never had so many as this year. They joined the main road and were silent for a while. Then rounding a corner, the birdman suddenly applied the brakes. Two cars, facing in opposite directions, sat in the middle of the road, their drivers having a conversation. The birdman muttered and steered round them, the Land Rover tilting as it mounted the verge. I'd like to see them try that in Birmingham. Is that where you're from? He nodded. Why did you come to the island? The birds. Aye, I suppose there's not too many down there. He smiled and pointed to an open packet of polo mints on the dashboard. She lifted them and saw that the top suite was soiled the relief letters almost black. She prized it out and gave it to him. The white one beneath she put in her mouth. You born on the island? City born and bred. (laughs) I was lured here by a man 42 years ago. I never see him around. Oh, I'm not surprised. He's been dead this long time. She cracked the ring of the mint between her teeth. I'm sorry. What did he do? He drowned himself in the loch. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. On Christmas Day, he was mad in the skull, away with the fairies. What I mean was, what did he do for a living? What does it matter now? The birdman shook his head and concentrated on the road ahead. He was a shepherd, she said. Then a little later, he was the driver. There should always be one in the house who can drive. He let her off at the centre of the village, and she had to walk the steep hill to the post office. She breathed through her mouth and took a rest halfway up, holding onto a small railing. Distances grew with age. Inside, she passed over her pension book, 
got her money and bought a first-class stamp. She waited until she was outside before she took the letter from her bag. She licked the stamp, stuck it on the envelope, and dropped it in the letterbox. Walking down the hill was easier. She went to the co-op to buy sugar and tea and porridge. The shop was strung with skimpy tinsel decorations and the music they were playing was Christmas hits. In the butcher's, she bought herself a pork chop and some bacon. His bacon lasted longer than the packet stuff. When she had her shopping finished, she wondered what to do to pass the time. She could visit young Mary, but if she did that, she would have to talk. Not having enough things to say, she felt awkward listening to the tick of the clock and the distant cries of seabirds. Instead, she decided to buy a cup of tea in the cafe and treat herself to an almond bun. She sat near the window where she could look out for the post van. The cafe was warm, and it too was decorated. Each time the door opened, the hanging fronds of tinsel fluttered. On a tape somewhere, carols were playing. Two children sitting with their mother were playing with a new toy car on the tabletop. The cellophane wrapping had been discarded on the floor. She looked away from them and stared into her tea. When they dredged him up on Boxing Day, he had two car batteries tied to his wrists. He was nothing if not thorough. One of them had been taken from his own van parked by the lock shore, and the thing had to be towed to the garage. If he had been a drinking man, he could have been out getting drunk or fallen into bad company. But there was only the Black Depression. All that day, the radio had been on to get rid of the dread. When Silent Night came on the tape and the children started to squabble, she did not wait to finish her tea, but walked slowly to the edge of the village with her bag of shopping, now and again pausing to look over her shoulder. The scarlet of the post van caught her eye, and she stood on the verge with her arm out. When she saw it was Stuart driving, she smiled. He stopped the van, and she ducked down to look in the window. Anything for me today? He leaned across to the basket of mail which occupied the passenger seat position and began to rummage through the bundles of letters and cards held together with elastic bands. This job would be all right if it wasn't for bloody Christmas. He paused at her single letter. Aye, there is just one. Oh, good. You might as well run me up, seeing as you're going that way. He sighed and looked over his shoulder at a row of houses. Wait for me round the corner. She nodded and walked on ahead while he made some deliveries. Stuart seemed to take a long time. She looked down at the lock in the growing dark. The geese were returning for the night, filling the air with their squawking. They sounded like a dance hall, full of people laughing and enjoying themselves, heard from a distance on the night wind. Julie Berry reading Remote from The Great Profundo by Bernard McLaverty. It's published by Jonathan Cape at £9.95. Malcolm Bradbury's collection is The Penguin Book of Modern British Short Stories, published in hardback by Viking at £12.95. If your taste is more towards the macabre, you might try a new collection by Patricia Highsmith, Tales of Natural and Unnatural Catastrophe. Until next week, then, when we shall be knitting with the Bishop of Leicester, laughing with S.J. Perelman, and remembering the war with George Macbeth. Goodbye.